All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Let's get started with today's class. So today we I share with you the script for the the interpolation script um, last class. I think I asked you to have already downloaded that from GitHub and uh, copied that and pasted it inside of your code folder of the 07 EO monitor project. I asked you to do that last time. So you should you should have done that already um, and we should be ready to go. And before we get to that, I just want to kind of pave the way of what we're doing so we can understand better the process, where what we've done already, what we're going to do today, and where we're headed after here. So when it, when it comes to actually working with on-farm data, like we're working now with yield monitor data, um, so we basically brought the yield monitor data from, in class we did from one year, we wrangled that data first, we cleaned that data, removing potentially erroneous data points coming from the process of collecting um, yield monitor data. And that leaves some gaps in, in this field that we want to fill in those gaps. So we're gonna do some interpolation exercises today to fill in those gaps. And we're doing that in class for one of the years, the 2017 year uh, data. And as part of your assignments, you've been doing the same process for the 2019, 2020, in a way that in the end, we will have at least three years of view monitor data wrangled, clean, and interpolated for this field. And then we're gonna use that to explore further this yield data. So one of the things you're gonna be looking at after this exercise is the spatial and temporal variability of yield within the field in one year, but also over time. So you're gonna see that there are parts of this field that are high yielding every year, regardless of the year. There are parts of it that are gonna be low yielding regardless of the year, but there are parts of it that are gonna flip. So they may be high yielding in one year and maybe low yielding in another year. So we're going to explore that analysis here, the yield spatial temporal stability. Afterwards, we're going to process for this same field here, we're going to process soil EC data, so electric conductivity. We're going to process terrain data in the sense of getting elevation, but then using that to calculate slope, aspect, and other features related to terrain. And then we're going to combine all those into management zones. So we're going to create management zones that in one side are going to be based on yield only, and another side are going to be based on the, the soil properties and terrain properties that we're processing here. We're going to compare those, understand what are the effects of, depending what layer we have in this management zone creation, how that determines different, different zones, and then going all the way to creating um, prescription rates based on those zones. And I think for this field, that's, oh it, yeah, I think that's gonna be it uh, for this field. And then we'll get into some other topics. So as far as it relates to this field, we started working with yield data, wrangling, cleaning, interpolating. Then we're gonna do, um, you know, for soil EC and elevation data as well to get to the management zone side of things and do variable rate application based on that. So right now in that process, we are still working with the yield data and, and uh, processing that so we can move forward with the next steps for this specific field. All right, so um, <clears throat> please go ahead and launch your 07 EO monitor R project if you have not done that yet. I, just a quick question, Professor, if I may. And if you <clears throat> if you come here on the Files tab and you click on the R blue button to take you to the home page or the home directory of the project, you go in code and I want you to launch the, um, so in your, I mean, I have potentially more scripts than you have, but you wanna launch the zero, let's see, zero 09 or 0219 EO17 interpolation partial. That's the one that we're going to be developing today. All right. So specifically for today, uh, the learning objectives are going to be for us to learn about why do we need interpolation for this field and um, why is it useful for us as we move forward in this workflow. 
Um, we're going to explore one specific type of interpolation. It's going to be the most common and simplest interpolation method that's called inverse distance weighted. You may have heard about this. You may have used this as the simplest one. That's what we're going to be using. I will be providing you with resources in case you do want to explore on your side how to do other more complicated um, interpolation methods like different types of Kriging. But in this class, we're going to be doing IDW. And then we're going to apply IDW to the yield data set in class or with me. We're going to do the on the yield 17. Um, so you have the so yield, yield 17, we have the process and the clean version, right? So the process was the one that got out of the wrangling exercise. The clean version was the one that got out of the yield editor exercise. So we have those two. We're going to use the clean clean version of that to then interpolate here. Um, and then we're going to extract those interpolated points um, to a grid and save them to file so we can use in the next exercise, which is going to be the yield, st yield stability exercise. All right. <clears throat> so I left you some, uh, the chunk of the packages here. Again, I think I'm not sure if you have GSTAT and STARS packages. What I would say is have your cursor in the first package there and run line by line instead of running the whole chunk. If you have that given package, it's gonna go through without giving you errors. If you do not have a package, it's gonna yell at you saying that it does not have that package. In which case, if that happens, you know already how to fix that. You just need to do an install.packages and then give that package name in quotation marks. I left you here on top of this chunk, some of the packages that you may need uh, or some of the install.packages function that you may need to install the packages if you are missing them. So just gonna give you a quick moment here to do that. And once you install them, make sure you load them using the library function that I left there and that you comment off the install.packages function or delete that from your script. <clears throat> All right, I'm gonna move on here. If anyone has that issues installing, let me know. But if I don't hear anything, I'll keep moving. So the first thing, as I told you in this script here, we're gonna be doing this for the yield 17. So for data from 2017 for this field that we've been working with. If you remember, we had previously, and I just wanna say this again, just so it, it clicks to you if it hasn't yet. So we brought in the raw CSV data. We use a script to wrangle it. And we, so we brought in CSV, wrangled it, exported as a GeoJSON. That was the, um, that was the, what was the name again that we gave it? Was that the clean? No, that was the, sorry, I'm blinking on the name that we gave it. It was processed, yes, thank you. So the process was the one that was just wrangled and then we got that wrangled one brought into the yield editor script and removed the erroneous points and then exported as the clean version. And now we want to bring the clean version that has been through wrangling and cleaning to now do the interpolation. So let's bring in that uh, data set here in, uh, in this chunk. It is a, a, it is a geospatial vector file that on your file system is a geojson. As we bring that into R, it's gonna become an SF object. So because of that, we're gonna use read underscore SF. We give it the path here. Um, so this is this the, the GeoJSON we exported from the class script. So it should be on your data folder. So dot dot forward slash to get outside of code. We navigate to data. And that should be the yield 17 clean.geojson. So again, this is the version that has been through wrangling and cleaning scripts already. <clears throat> So if we read that in, we can print it. Um, I have 
almost 27,000 rows here. In your case, it may be a little bit fewer just because or more. I guess it could be a little bit different, mostly because of that position filter that we use where each one of us use our own digitized boundary. And you may have chosen a different size of the buffer because of your boundary. So if your number here is different, that's okay. You should still have the same columns though. So, um, well, your number should not be very different. Like if you have, I don't know, plus or minus like a thousand to 2000 rows here, then I would perhaps worry. But if you're still within, you know, plus or minus 2000 rows, you should be okay. It's just a difference of your boundary. But you should still have the seven columns here. So speed miles per hour, yield pounds per acre, yield kilograms per hectare, speed kilograms or kilometers per hour. Um, and then I have here the leaflet ID, the feature type, and the geometry. So you should still have that. <clears throat> if we come here to the next chunk, I'm just going to do a summary, as I always recommend you do on your date when you're bringing bring in new data. So we see here the min and max of the speed, it makes sense. Uh, the min and max of yield, it makes sense. Uh, in kilograms per hectare is just a transformation of that. So it, it makes sense there as well. Speed kilometers per hour also makes sense. It's related to that miles per hour. We just transformed that. And then the other ones, we're not really interested in them. Okay, so so we brought in the yield data. Now for us to do interpolation, we're gonna have to create a grid. To create a grid, we're gonna need a boundary. So let's bring in the boundary of this field here in this next chunk. Again, the boundary is also a geojson. So we're gonna use read underscore SF. If you recall, the, the way that we've, we've been importing the boundary is you all digitize that on the 05 digitizing project. So that boundary that you created should be in your output folder of that project. So we could do one of two things. We could either copy that and paste into the data folder of this project or simply navigate to that project right here in the path. I want to do that here. So dot dot forest slash, I am in the main folder of this project. Another dot dot forward slash, I am in the main folder of my course, which now I can navigate to the 05 digitizing. If I hit tab, I can go, in my case, I export that to output inside of digitizing. I think in your case, is probably there as well. And then we have the boundary. In this case here, if we have both the shape file or the GeoJSON, it doesn't really matter which one you bring in. I'm going to bring the GeoJSON one. So we bring that. <clears throat> If we inspect it, it is WGS84, which means it is a geographic CRS, which means it is in degrees, uh, the unit is degrees. I do want this to be in meters because sometimes when we're doing, especially when we're doing distance-based functions like interpolation is one of them because things that are closer in space are gonna be more correlated and things that are farther away are gonna be less correlated. And that is what goes behind any um, interpolation method, meaning that we're using a distance measure to do the interpolation. Because of that, I want our boundary to be in meters instead of degrees. So let's use here this function uh, or the pipe. And we're going to change. So just to remind you, as we bring in boundary W, it already has a CRS. So we don't have to set a CRS, right? Because it already comes with it. I just want to change it to a different one. What is the function that we need here? So I can, was that Renalisa or Neva? Renalisa? Can you, can you? Yes. So Renalisa said ST underscore transform. That's correct, right? That's the one that when the layer already has a CRS, just want to change it, we use ST transform. So the CRS that I want to use here, so it has an argument called CRS. We can say CRS equals to the EPSG code that I want to use is 6345. So if you run that and then you just print it, now your CRS should be NAD83 UTM zone 16 North. So now this is in meters and not degrees anymore, which is what we want it to be. 
All right, so I think I left you all the code of, of the next chunk. So if you just wanna, what we're doing here, I'm just making a static plot using ggplot where I'm plotting the clean yield data uh, column from the object that we imported and just adding the boundary overlay on it and assigning that plot to an object called eel clean underscore map and then printing that object below. So if you just run this, it's gonna show you that map. So this is what is going on, right? So we re so right now, even though it looks pretty continuous of a layer, but that's because we have a lot of points, right? However, if we were to do a map view and zoom in, you would be able to see the actual individual points. And so it's for us to not, not get fooled by the density of points, this is still a point layer, meaning that it has gaps, right? So there are gaps, First, because every time you sample point data, there will always be gaps, right? Um, it's not a continuous type of layer like a raster would be. It is a vector point data. Also, because we remove some of those points because of the filters that we applied. So now we have these gaps where there's no data or there, is, there are no points where there used to be points. So we have these gaps in this map and we want to fill them in because I still want to... Um, assume or have a yield point continuously in this field so we can make recommendations for every piece of this field and not have gaps where I would say, well, I don't know how what to do here because I don't have yield for this plot or for this space in this in this field. So we do want to interpolate because of that, right? We want to fill in the gaps. Um, so that's that's the need that we have here. Sometimes, so if you think about it, I don't I have not planned yet, so I, I don't think we're going to have this class in this semester uh, related to gridded soil samples and interpolating those. Well, yeah, I, I guess at this point, I'm not sure if we're going to have, depends on time. But if you just think about it, if you, if this, so this field here, I don't know how many acres it is, probably, I don't know, 60, 70 acres in size. So it's a very, you know, good size field. Imagine that if you were soil taking geo, um, you're taking the coordinates of soil samples that you make. So imagine you made a grid and you did like soil sampling in this grid and you wanted to associate those soil test results to that space on the field, right? So we would go to a, to a spot, take a GPS coordinate, take a soil sample there, send for analysis. You can connect back those results to a space specific location in the field. Imagine you had that in this field and maybe you have 30 points spread out across this field. Let's just make, make up a number. So 30 points spread out in this field, kind of, you know, in a grid. Maybe that's going to be easier to think that you have very few points. So we have a lot of empty space between those points, but you still want to have some type of knowledge of what is going on in between the points, right? The same way that we're interpolating here, we would also interpolate in that case where we want to have a continuous layer of, let's say, soil pH or maybe phosphorus or potassium or something else that we want to have continuously in this field and even in places where we did not sample, right? So that's what interpolation is going to allow us to create. Um, and again, perhaps in our case here of yield is not as clear just because we have so many points, but we still have those gaps that we're going to be addressing. So, um, there are two main classes of interpolation methods. One of them is deterministic, which inverse distance weight is the main method there, which is basically what inverse distance weight is saying is the closest a point is to where I'm trying to interpolate. So let's say I'm trying to interpolate a cell here and there's a point right here. That point is going to be heavily weighted towards the predicted value that I'm interpolating. However, a point that's farther away is going to have less impact on this interpolation method. So it's basically just a function that the closer the points, the actual points that you sampled are to where you're interpolating, those are going to have more heavier weight towards that interpolated value. And those that are farther away are going to have lower weight into that interpolated value. Another uh, very common type of interpolation method is called Krigging. 
So in Krigging, um, it's a little bit more complex because it is it uses statistical principles of how what is the structure of that um, of that of that correlation in space. So it's not going to simply use this fixed formula like inverse distance weighted to say closer points are more correlated, farther away or less, but it's actually going to give you an um, an idea of how close or how far a very specific variable is correlated. So let you know one example to think about is, you know, maybe texture would be something if you have a field that's highly variable in texture, maybe you should only for texture consider points that are within a radius of, I don't know, let's just say a number maybe like a hundred meters. So only points within a hundred meters should be used to interpolate for texture. But maybe if you're talking about something that, you know, maybe is so a field that where texture is very homogeneous, but you're still interpolating, maybe that range of, of or the radius that you're considering could be, you know, I don't know, five, six, seven hundred meters rather than a hundred. So this idea of how or what what is the distance of points where you have a correlation that you should take into account, and after that point you should not take into account because there's nothing there. It's something that Krigging allows us to calculate, whereas IDW does not. So Krigging is more complex, is also a more precise method, uh, but also requires more data points initially to be a good method. So there are some trade-offs there. And again, if you do want to explore Krigging, I will um, I'll share a, a, a resource with you that you can read and it has the methods, it has R code, so you can implement on your, on your side. But in, for simplicity, we're just going to use IDW in this class. Before we do implement this, I do want to show this uh, resource that I have that I will share with you. So this is a it's an ebook called um, what's the name of this? Yeah, so it's called Introduction to Spatial Data Programming with R. So it's a very good resource. It is free, open source. It has a lot of code. It has a lot of explanation. So I'll share with you the link for this ebook here. But what I want to show you here are some examples that they have uh, for some of these methods. And I just and I want to make one point here that is going to be really interesting for us to think about. So again, here we're just showing this example of what is interpolation. So you go to a field, you collect point samples that you have a given value for them, but you have a lot of empty space where you do not you do not sample, but you do want to know what were those values in those empty spaces. We do interpolation to create those maps, right? So this is just one example of that uh, of what we're doing. This is another example with a different measure here, CO2 emissions, and then interpolating to this map here. Um, it does give, give you some more formula and information about the weighted average principle, which IDW uses. And the point I want to make here is to do an interpolated map is very simple, and you're going to see that next. Just because you see a pretty map with pretty colors, it does not mean it is a good map. And I want to make a point here where even, even just within IDW, it has this power. So P stands for power. It has this power argument that you can change. So here you, you see that. So the points and the data points represented by the crosses are all the same. The maps behind them, the interpolated maps behind those points are different, and that is being affected by the power that's been used on the IDW formula. So as you can see, you can get very different looking maps just by changing the power of that IDW equation, let alone if you compare that with Krigging or with other methods, right? So this is an example, again, if you use IDW for this specific data set, what you would get if you do ordinary Krigging and universal Krigging, you see how the maps are looking very different, right? And we're not going to get too much into that merit in this class, but I do want to bring this up to you that there are ways for us to assess if a given interpolation method did a good job or not. And when we see pretty maps, you know, that does not mean that that interpolated map is the best for whatever they're using that for. So I just wanted to you know, say that there are many ways of creating interpolated maps. 
keep that in mind as you do your own research um, or as you create maps for any any purpose because as you see if the map behind here the interpolated map is changing it means that your decisions will be also changing right and then you know we should be really thinking about how we're creating these maps to make sure we're creating good maps and not just you know pretty looking maps let's see i think that's all i wanted to show. yeah so i think that's i just wanted to show you that distinction of different maps depending on the arguments within a given method but also as you compare across different methods all right Okay, so <clears throat> what is going to happen here when we do any interpolation method is we need to have a grid on which the interpolated uh, or the interpolation predictions are going to be based on. And I think it's going to make more sense as we actually do this. So let's go ahead and first thing, create a grid that I want to assign to an object called grid underscore V. And the V there is just uh, the distinction I'm making to say that this grid is a vector geospatial type is not raster yet. So to make a a grid that's a vector geospatial type, we use this function called st underscore make underscore grid from the SF package. The first thing we give here that we're going to do is give it the boundary so it knows where in space this grid is going to be based on. So our boundary is that object that we imported that's called boundary underscore W. You give it a comma. I'm going to break code just to make it easier to see. And it has an argument called cell size. So here is where we would give the size of the cell of this grid. I want to propose we use cell sizes of 10. And in this case, 10 is 10 meters because our boundary is in meter CRS. <clears throat> I am proposing that we use 10 meters because I think it's a good compromise. Um, if you imagine, you could go with larger cells. Um, this should probably come back to the decision of what cell size you use for this interpolation grid. Should probably come back to first, can you collect data at at least that size, hopefully less than that size, uh, but also we're going to use these cells here to then base our zone man management zone creation. So if I create cells that are way too small that an equipment, an ag equipment would not even be able to address, let's say I do a, like a one meter cell size, right? I can, I can have one meter cell size here, no problem. The problem is, am I going to be able to actually act on cells that are one meter by one meter size? Probably not, right? So probably if you're going to apply, I don't know, variable rate, fertilizer of some sort or, or anything else that we can apply variable rates, you're probably not going to be able to vary the rate of that input on a one by one by one meter uh, resolution. So having too small of a, of a cell size, if your equipment cannot handle that, it's probably not going to help you much. Um, also, because the smaller cell size we have, the more computationally intensive it becomes because you have more cells to make interpolation predictions over. So that's that's a that's a conversation going to the smaller size of the cell, but now going to, on the larger size of the cell. Perhaps we could go with 20, 50, even 100 meter cell size, but then I think there's a point that starts defeating the purpose of variable rate because if you have really large cells, um, then you're really averaging over a lot of data, and then you, you start losing a little bit on these on the purpose of of having a variable rate capacity on. For any management practices. So I want to propose we do 10. I do. So once we go through the script here, you're going to be actually able to visualize what a 10 by 10 meter cell looks like for this field. If you want to play around this number on your own, or even in class, we can do a little bit of that. Uh, you're welcome to explore. All right. So if you run that and you print grid V, you're going to see that it has <clears throat> six so six thousand two hundred and eight features. So this is basically saying it has those are the number of cells that it has basically, and it just has cells. So right now it has no data in those cells. It's just cells. 
if we check the class of this object using the function class, we see that it is a SFC. So it's an SF object of type polygon. So each one of the cells is actually a small polygon on this field. Because this is a vector geospatial type of object, because we use SF object to create it. All right, so let's make, um, I want, so hey. this, yes, somebody has a question. Right. Yeah, I'm just double checking, but I'm assuming we would still have slightly different numbers on the geometry just because our boundaries are slightly different. Yes, that, that that's okay. a good, good observation. Yeah, so you may have a, you know, a different number of cells here because of our boundaries being different. Yeah. That's true. All right. So the EO clean map, we it's an object we created above with the with the map. If you just print that, it's going to show you the map here. What I want to do next is to add the grid on top of this so we can actually see what the grid what is happening with that grid object that we just created. So because EO clean map is a ggplot object, I can just add a plus and just keep coding. What geom do I need here to show the grid? Rujval, what do you think? Uh, perhaps point is point. Okay, so Rujval is suggesting geom point. Somebody else online had a any thoughts? Yeah. Sorry, if, if somebody in Tifton said something, I, I didn't I didn't hear it. I said that at the GeoMass app, but I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay. So let's think about that. So if so we have two prepositions here, geom point and GeoMass app. Let's look into what, what type of object we have here, right? So the the type of object, oops, right here. So this grid V, it is an SF object. And because of that, the geospatial information is in the geometry column because it is an SF object. And because of that, we use GeomSF. Geom points would work if this was not an SF object, if it was just a data frame, and we needed to have columns with like X and Y or a long lat or something like that. So geom points could work as well, um, but because it is an SF object, we do need to use GeomSF. So let's go ahead and, and call GeomSF here. We need to specify the data. So data is gonna be equals to this object called grid V, grid underscore V. I do want to change, before we run it, I do want to change a few things of how it looks. So I added a comma. Uh, it's not going to be in a yes, because I'm going to apply the same properties to all cells. So I want to, the alpha to be equals to 0.5. So changing transparency to 50%. I want the fill to be equals to an A, so we can see through it. There's no fill. And I want the size to be equals to 0.1. Size here, it just relates to the line width of the of those little polygons that we have. So if we go ahead <clears throat> and run that, this is what we get, right? So that's what a 10 by 10 meter cell size looks like for this field. If we wanna play around very quickly here with that, I'm gonna change my cell size to 100. And then just rerun the, the map. This is how it looks like, right? So as you change cell size, this is what is visually happening on this field. I, I'm not gonna do for the one meter because it, it, it may take a little while, well, just a moment perhaps, but you can do that on your side if you wish. If you did play around with cell size, please make sure you go back to 10 and rerun that grid V. So you have a grid of cell size 10, and then you can just rerun the plot so we can see how that looks like. Okay, so something that is commonly done when you're creating grids um, is that 
as you can see, we gave the boundary as the the cookie uh, cookie cutter shape here for that for the grid. However, it created grid cells outside of the boundary. What it does here is that it looks at the bounding box. So the bounding box is an important concept in GIS, where the bounding box would be northmost, eastmost, southmost, and westmost points of your of whatever largest geospatial object you have. And largest, I mean in space, not in not in not in megabytes or or computer size. So you see that the cells are extending to those outermost points in all directions. And that's our bounding box of the boundary. Uh, and that's why we have those points there. OK, so we created this grid. And if you think about it, each one of these cells is a polygon, is a very small polygon. However, for us to do interpolation, we need to have this grid here in raster. So those polygons, right now we have little polygons here. We need to transform them to raster cells. So that's what we're gonna do next here on this chunk. So if you come here, I'm calling this grid underscore R to mean that it is raster. So what is, we're going to start off with the grid V, which is the object that we created the grid as a vector. I wanna give it a pipe. Before we transform this to raster, we have to force it to be, so right now grid V is an SFC type of object that we saw on the class here. So it's S SFC, we need it to be, it's just like one step that we have to make here to make it be seen as SF, not simply SFC. So to do that, we use a function ST underscore S underscore SF. So we force it to be an SF object um, and not simply SF, SFC object. So if we print it, now it looks more like an SF object when we print it. And really, I mean, behind the scenes, it makes a difference as far as we're concerned. It's, it's just one step in that flow that we have to do. Then we add a pipe. We're going to use a function called st underscore rasterize. Rasterize from the stars package. So this function here is going, this is what it may, what is going to change those cells, those, oh, I'm sorry, those polygons into raster cells. It has a couple arguments we want to change. One of them is dx. So that's the dimension on the x-axis. I want to say dx equals to 10 and dy equals to, equals to 10 as well. So we're saying that the dimensions of the raster cells to remain 10 by 10. So if we do that, and we printed now this has become a raster object it is or uh, or a stars object and stars is the package we use to handle one of the packages we use to handle raster object types in r um okay so we will come back to this chunk here but first i want to make a map for us to visualize this so if you go to the next chunk, I left you that EO clean map, which again is just the, the ggplot object that we created in the beginning of this script here. So I wanna add here the, the, the raster um, grid. So we're gonna add a plus. I don't remember if we have seen this yet, but now this object is of class stars. There is a geome that we can use here that is just specifically for that. So we would use a geom underscore stars. So remember, geom SF is if you have a geospatial vector type of file that in R it's being interpreted as an SF object. Geom stars, on the other hand, is if you have a raster type of geospatial file that in R is being interpreted as a stars object. So geom SF, for SF objects, geom stars for stars objects. So we just come here, we say data equals to gonna be that grid underscore R that we just created above. And before we run it, I just wanna add a comma and ask for the transparency to be 70%. So alpha equals to 0.7. Okay. <clears throat> so this is what we get um, when we do that. 
what is happening here is that the way the geom stars is showing us a little bit different and really it doesn't matter as much uh, for us to understand but what is doing here is changing the fill of the so now these are raster cells so remember raster would be like an image right so it's, it's a continuous layer you have no gaps everywhere there is a cell there's going to be a value associated with it or if no values associated with it, at least gonna there's gonna be an NA in that cell. So there's not good is there's no such thing as a raster that is not a complete, fully continuous layer. All cells are there regardless if they have values or not, which is the difference between raster and vector. Vector, there are empty spaces, right? So there is empty space between two points, there are empty spaces between two polygons, and that's okay. Rasters do not have empty spaces. If it is empty, the cell is still there. Is just coded as an A. So what's doing here is it has this ID, it created for us an ID column, which is basically just a number for the cell. So it's going from one to 6,000 something because 6,000 is about the number of cells we have. And it's just coloring according to that. So this color really doesn't make a lot of sense. Yeah. So is there a reason that but my ID could go, um, the geom star, the map that I just created, I have a different, but my ID has more than more like six. And it's like I have five thousand, three thousand, two thousand, or one thousand. No, that's yeah. So let me address that. Uh, so Doug here is asking that on his side, what on this plot here, he has more like breaks in this um, fill legend here. That that is just a way that so when you plot plots, it is just like a decision it makes behind the scenes. So it's just on the visualization side. It may be related to the fact that you have a different number of of cells to begin with because of your boundary. So really, it's just on the visualization side. If you have differences in the in the breaks here, the ticks, that that's that's not a problem. All right. So something that we see here is we have values. So each one of these raster cells has a value going from one, let's say I'm assuming one is probably the darkest side. So probably one is here and then is increasing as you go to the left and as you go up on the way that probably the largest value here is probably on this corner, right? So all cells here have a cell ID that is going from one to the max number of rows you have in this data frame. I do want to, however, kind of exclude the data points outside of the of the boundary because whenever we do the interpolation, I only want to interpolate within the boundary. I do not want to, I guess, extrapolate. So do interpolation outside of the boundary of this field. I don't, don't want to do that. So I do want to crop this raster grid to only be within the boundary. So to do that, we come back to the chunk where we created the grid, our object. Right after that SC rasterize, we're gonna give it a pipe, break the break line and call a function called ST underscore crop. So we're gonna crop this raster based on the boundary. So the raster is what's coming through the pipe. So inside of ST crop, we just give it the boundary. So we say, this is the cookie, cookie cutter shape that I want to crop this with. So if you run that, it's still a grid or, or a still a, a raster, um, I'm sorry, still a stars object. Now I'm going to rerun the map here and do want to pay attention to what's gonna happen with the colors outside of the boundary. So notice how now we have the ID colors within the boundary. However, because this is a raster, again, raster has to be a continuous layer where you have cell continuous cells. So there is no gaps in cells. Whenever you, in this case, we cropped to the boundary, what happened was every pixel in this raster that is outside of the boundary is still there. It's just that now it is coded as NA. And this is important when we do the, the interpolation because if it is an A, it's not going to interpolate on, the, on those NA points. However, again, they're still there. If we were, if we would have done a similar operation on the grid vector, 
So the only, when you was, instead of cells, instead of raster cells, we had polygons, those polygons would have been gone, right? There was not gonna, there would not be polygons with NAs. It would just not be polygons at all. Vectors, you can have those empty spaces in a raster cell. Within that bounding box, you have a continuous, cells are continuous. You don't have gaps in cells. The difference is just if you do or do not have data in those cells. And, and really right now, the only data that this raster has, again, is the cell ID, which is really useless, right? We don't care for cell ID, uh, but it is what we have. So I just wanted to help you perhaps to visualize this difference between a raster and a vector in a different way now. All right, so we have our our raster that we're gonna use to do the interpolation over. We have the data points of the yield that we want to use for that interpolation. So we're basically ready to run IDW in the next chunk here. So in R, the way we do, we run IDW is a two a two step process where the first step is to call the function that defines the formula of the interpolation. And then we use that formula in a second step to do the prediction, or in other words, to actually do the interpolation. So it's really interesting to think about it because interpolation is just prediction. You're using data in a model to predict what values would be in places you have not sampled. So interpolation is prediction. All right, so the first step here, defining the formula, uh, I wanna assign this to the IDW underscore mod object. We're gonna use a function called gstat from one of the packages you install for this exercise. It has an argument called formula. So I wanna say formula equals to, the way that it works is, so let me just, um, so we're gonna give it a formula here, but I just wanna give a comma before we do that. And it also has an argument called data. So the data where the formula is gonna be based on is our yield 17 underscore C. That is the object that we imported with the wrangle clean yield data points for the 2017 year. I brought that in here just so we could run just yield 17 below, just so we can see what columns it has. So what we're gonna specify in the formula is gonna be any one of these columns that we want to interpolate. In our case, of course, we want to interpolate yield. That's our measure of interest. We could do either pounds per acre or kilograms per hectare. I want to propose we do pounds per acre in this exercise. So I just copied that name of the column. I come back here to the formula, and the way that we specify it is just saying yield pounds per acre till day one. That is the formula. It's a very simple formula, which basically means please interpolate using the yield pound per acre column but we need to give it in a formula syntax, which is why we need the tilde and the one. So if you run this and we print IDW mod, it is just this formula, right? So there's nothing special about it. If we check the class, it is a class gstat and list. So it is a gstat object, which is gonna be important on the next step because the next step is gonna require for the input to be a gstat object. All right, so if you come to the next chunk, this is where the actual interpolation or prediction is gonna happen. So I wanna assign the result to this object called IDW pred. We give it a assignment symbol. We're gonna use a function called predict. Where the, the this function is gonna require two arguments here. So the first one is the actual formula that we created above. So that's the object IDW underscore mod. The next argument, now this is gonna be important for us to realize. So we're given the formula and really the data is coming along with that formula object, right? Because we specified the data right there. So the data and the formula are coming through this IDW mod object. But now we need to specify the grid over which we want to interpolate. So this is where we would give that grid underscore R object. This is very interesting to think about because I think a lot of times we don't fully realize that for you to do interpolation, you have to define a grid over which the cells of the grid are gonna receive a prediction of that interpolation method. So we are giving here the grid. You can go ahead and run it. It may take a quick moment here, but we, it's given 
there's a message saying inverse distance weighted interpolation. And it had like a turning wheel for some time there just to, to indicate that it was working on it. On my side, it finished working. So I'm just gonna print that IDW pred. This is also a stars object as we can check on the class. So it is a stars object. And stars objects don't print as nicely as SF objects. But what we can see here is that it has two new columns. One is called var1 pred, where the predictions are, so the yield predictions for each one of those cells are being, is showing us a, a statistical summary of that. And then there is this other column called var1 var. And I do want to make one point here. So with the package gstat, we can do a DW, we can also do Kriging. Right now, our var1 var column is all in ace when we do IDW. And that's because that's the way it is. IDW does not give you that does not give you information on the variability or the variance of that prediction. It just gives you a prediction. However, this column is still here, var1 var is still here, even though in our case it's just an ace, because if we would have used a different GSTAT formula that, that is used for Kriging, Kriging would give you a variance or variability measure along with your prediction or of the interpolation value. So if we had set up a workflow to do Kriging, the var1 var column would have actual values, and that normally is, we can use those values. If we do Kriging, we can use those values to understand what parts of this field had higher variance when we interpolated, meaning that maybe if you want to address that higher variance, you can go back and resample. In our case here, it's not really doable because it is yield data that has already happened. But if it was like soil data, you know, it could go back and say, okay, I have a high variability of the prediction of the interpolation right on this part of the field. I can go there and pull more, pull more samples, analyze, bring back to the data set, rerun it, and be more certain of that interpolated value. That's why we have this var1 var column here. In our case, again, IDW does not provide you that measure, so it's all an ace. Okay, so let's make a plot. So can we you go back to the code. Yes. Can you go back to the previous chunk? Because I got an error. This one here? Yeah. Did anyone else get an error when doing the interpolation? Uh, the error said in model dot frame dot default turns for invalid type list or variable. Okay. Uh, take a look at this. So here's where we're defining the formula. So I would say make sure that you specify the correct name of the object for the data and also that you specify the correct column name to be interpolated and that you have your comma there separating the formula from the data argument. Okay. Yield selecting C. On data yield C. I have everything here, but I don't have a error in that. Okay. In is it just that list? I still have the error. So let's do this. I am we're kind of getting towards the end of the exercise. So if you for now can hold on, because I want to get to the end of here and I want to give you all time to complete an assignment in class. So when okay. we get to that point, uh, I can connect with you, Rolando, and then we can troubleshoot that, if that's okay. Yeah. Awesome. All right. <clears throat> okay, so we were at the chunk here where, where I want to create a plot to visualize this. So I, I left the ggplot call here. I did not want to give a data in AES at this level for this plot because we're going to be bringing different data sets through different geomes. So for now, let's just leave a ggplot like that. Give it a plus. The next step here is I want to plot the IDW pred object that we just created. That object is of type stars. So we're going to use geome underscore stars to plot it in ggplot. So we need to say data 
equals to IDW pred. And we can just leave it that. If you run it, you should get something like this. So as you can see there, this is our field. It's not, so we had this conversation before, I guess. Geome SF knows that you are creating a map. So it sets your Y and X coordinates uh, to a fixed mm -hmm. amount. So it looks like your, your actual field when you plot a Geome SF. Geome stars for some reason does not do that. So our plot, our map here does not actually look like our field. It's kind of compressed. Uh, but we're going to work on that. Also notice we have our points that were interpolated. Um, and now they are, we have interpolations for each one of those cells, right? So we do not have the points anymore that were behind the data set that we processed. Now we have interpolated, predicted yield values for each one of the cells of that raster. Also notice how, because it is a raster, we still have all those cells all the way within the bounding box, but we do not have any interpolated values outside of the boundary. That's because we did that ST crop on the boundary, which set the cells outside the boundary to an ACE, so it does not interpolate on those. If we had not done that, we would have values for the entire bounding box area. Okay. Uh, the Immediate next thing here is just, I want to change this color scheme to something that we've been using. So let's add a plus, and then we change this using the scale underscore fill underscore Verides. Um, I guess it could be Verides C. So this is what it will look like. Now the next thing is I want to give the boundary. So let's give it a plus. The boundary is an SF object. So geom underscore SF data equals to boundary underscore W. That's our object. And I just want to give it a comma and say fill equals to NA. So we do not have a fill. We can see through it. So now when you do that, we should be seeing the boundary. And now again, geom SF is a little bit smarter than geom stars. So it knows this is a map and it sets your, your X and Y ranges, X and Y axis ranges to the proper ones for this to be, to look like what it, what it would be in space. Okay, so the next thing I wanna bring here is the grid as a vector, just so we can see those polygons overlaid on. So right now we can kind of see their cells, but I do wanna bring that grid as a vector so we can actually see the cell, excuse me, the cell polygons. So let's add a plus, do a geom underscore SF again, because I want to bring the grid as a vector. So data equals grid underscore V. I'm just changing here alpha to 0.5, fill to NA, and size to 0.1, just to help visualize it. Let me still show the code. So again, I'm showing you here the grid in a vector format. Uh, we use the raster one to do interpolation because that's what the GSTAT function requires. But we can kind of see now, you know, the grid cells, we can really tell more closely that we have, you know, one interpolated value for each one of those cells uh, in, this, in this field here. And they're we're all interpolated until the boundary, we did not go beyond the boundary. Okay, so here, the next step, I would just wanna explain to you a little bit more. So you, we could at this point decide to work with IDW pred as a raster file and just keep working with raster files. I do want to propose that we bring it back to a vector. So now that we have interpolated to a grid that was a raster and now IDW pred, which is the one that we see the yield colors here right now is a raster. I do want to transform it to back to vector. So I want to transform back to having polygons and having columns of, in this case, yield associated with each one of those polygons. Because I think it's gonna be easier for us to visualize what's gonna happen in the next steps of this exercise. Um, and I think it's a little bit more intuitive than looking at a raster stars object. 
So right now, IDW looks like IDW pred, the object that we had the predictions looks like this, right? We do, it shows us a summary of that yield interpolated value, but it does not give us a column like we used to have with a data frame or an SF object. Because of that, I do want to transform this from raster to vector. So back to vector. So that's what I do here in the next chunk. If you want to come and code with me, we're going to, the first thing we give it is the IDW underscore pred. So that's the object that we do have that right now is raster is a stars object. <clears throat> Let's give it a pipe. We're going to transform this to vector. So from, from raster to vector, we're going to use a function called st underscore s underscore sf. And we're going to change a couple of arguments here. One of the arguments is called s underscore points. I want to say equals to false. The default here is equals to true. So if, if you don't change this to false, it's going to basically take each one of those cells and give it back to you a point, a centroid of those of that cell, and that's gonna be what it gives back to you. I do not wanna have a point. I wanna keep the cells that we have 10 by 10. So we say as points equals to false. And also I wanna say merge equals to false. The default is true. And to get what we want, we need to set this to false. So if you run that and you print IDW Pred V, now you see that it is a simple feature collection. So it is an SF object with 4,046 features in two fields. Where the two fields that we have, one is called var one pred, which is where our predicted interpolated yield value is. And the other one is var one var, we already talked about that one. And then we have the geometry. Before we wrap up here, um, I do want to select and rename one of these columns. So let's give it a pipe. I want to use the dplyr colo colon select function. So I want to select the var one dot pred. So basically we're leaving behind var var one var, which in our case again is all NAs, but I do want to rename that here. So we on select, once you specify the column you want, you can provide a name before it to rename it. So I want to rename this to IP to mean interpolated yield underscore LBAC. So it would be, it will look like this, IP yield underscore LBAC equals to var one pred. So we're selecting var one pred, renaming it on the same function to IP yield pump breaker. If we run that, um, let's see, I got a warning here. Maybe I typed dplyr. Hmm. I'm not sure what happened. You have the same? Let's see if we printed. So it still still worked. I guess if you print IDW pred v, it still only uh, selected the var1 pred and renamed it. I'm not sure. I don't remember seeing this warning before, but normally warnings are just telling you something, but it's not an error. So it still goes through. So if you've got a, a warning here, and but it's still we're able to have the result that we wanted, then that's okay. And now if you check the class, this is an SF object and a data frame object. So now just printing again, IDW pred, you can see that we have, so 4,000, in my case, 4,046 features, because those are the name, or sorry, those are the number of what were cells, now they are polygons within the boundary, right? Before we had 6,000 something because it included all the cells outside of the boundary. Now, because this is a vector, a vector file is, you can have empty spaces. So when we transform from S to vector, it basically dropped all DNA polygons, right? So remember, raster has cells and a raster file is continuous. So if there is no data in the cell, the cell is still there, it just has an NA. A vector file is different. It's gonna have shapes, in this case, a polygon. If a polygon does not have data, it just drop that. And that's okay with vectors. It does not happen with rasters. Okay, so <clears throat> let's make a couple more plots here to wrap up so we understand 
you know, I know that one of the things that I myself go through, and I know a lot of students also go through this, is whenever we're working in a programming language, there's a lot that goes on by typing code. And sometimes we kind of miss having that interactivity of the map or maybe seeing something right right after you do, uh, an, uh, you know, a, apply something to a data, you want to see the result right in front of you. In a programming language setup, you have to call that. You have to create a map, create a table. Whereas if you're in QJS, it's right there in front of you. So that's why I like making plots um, so we can see what's happening with the objects that we're, we're creating. So let's begin here with a ggplot call. We had a plus sign. I wanna bring here IDW prad v, which we just created above. This is again, an SF object. So I hope you're thinking we need a geomSF. So we're gonna say data equals to that object name, which is IDW, IDW prad v. Now, because it is an SF object, uh, we can change what we want to fill the columns with. So when inside of AES, I wanna say fill equals to the column we created, which was IP yield underscore LBAC. If we run this, <clears throat> this is what we see. So I do want to remove the outline of these polygons because it's kind of adding some extra noise that we don't need. So if you come to GMSF outside of a yes, you add a comma and let's say color equals to NA. So that removes the outline of the polygon. We're just left with the fill, which is actually what we care about. And then finally, just changing this to scale underscore fill underscore Viridis, uh, Viridis C, we'll use that. Okay, so just you know, bringing up again, this is our final product of this exercise. So the interpolated, clean, wrangled version of yield seventeen is right in front of us. We can see that um, wherever we had holes in the data set because we removed data points, now they have been filled in because of the interpolation, and also the predictions were made all the way up to the boundary. Maybe in you know, in this case here, I'm. I'm proposing we use the boundary as our outer limit. We could have decided to use the buffer, right? So we could have been less than the boundary uh, if we wanted to. But in, anyways, in this case, I decided to use the boundary. Uh, so that's that's what we use here. Okay, so the next spot here is I just want to compare two things. So I want to compare the, the distribution of yield. So we're, the distribution, the statistical distribution, so the like the density distribution of the of the of the wrangled and clean data points, which were the actual data points collected, with the distribution of the data for the interpolated points, because they're different, and I want to see how different they are, and so we create that uh, understanding as well. So let's come here and start a. So a ggplot where we can add a plus. <clears throat> the first, so we're going to use geom underscore density. After that, I want to say data equals to, so the first statistical distribution I want to show is the one for the interpolated. So that is called, again, the data is idw underscore pred underscore v. It's the one that we just plotted above. Give it a comma. I want to call a yes. And because it is a density plot, we do not need to give a y-axis because the y-axis is calculated for us. We just need to give it an x-axis. So x equals to the variable that we want to know the distribution of, which is the I interpolated IP yield underscore LBAC for pump breaker. If you run that, this is what we get. So let me just... to show you my code. So we get a distribution, statistical distribution of the interpolated yield values um, that we have for this field in 2017. However, I do wanna add the density, the geom statistical density of the points 
that were not interpolated. So the points that were used behind the scenes to create this interpolated map. So let's add a plus, all geom density again. Now we're gonna ask for a different data set. So this is the one that we brought in all the way in the beginning of this exercise. That was the yield, let's see, yield 17 underscore C is the name of the data frame. Just to re remind you, that's the one that has like 20, almost, in my case, almost 20, 27,000 rows. Those were the actual EO points that came through the EO monitor data after we applied the filters to remove the potentially erroneous data points. So we give it a comma, call the AES function. I want the X axis to be this column yield pound per acre, since that was the one that we did interpolate. And then outside of the AES function, I just want to say color equals to blue. So we have a different color, so we know which one is which. If we run that, this is what we get. So again, the, the black line is the interpolated yield that we created. The blue line is the actual yield monitor data that was used behind the scenes to create interpolated values. What do you see here? Maybe let me ask someone in, in Tifton. What do you see here? What, what, what changed between the actual raw data points and the interpolated data points? If someone in Tifton can help me out. The interpolated points are they're I'd say they're a lot like closer together. There there's less variation between them. Yes, absolutely. So that's a great observation, right? So if you look at it, we have more of the so the black line is interpolated. We have more of the interpolated points around the mean of the distribution and less points on the tails, right? This is, I mean, it may not happen every time, but most likely it will happen most of the time because what we're doing is we're taking information from a whole bunch of points around it and making a prediction, right? So what you can kind of think of like, you're almost, to some extent we're averaging, but it is just averaging with different weights, but we are averaging a whole bunch of points and give one value. So if one of those multiple points was very high or very low in the tails of the blue distribution, it was just one point when it was considered to interpolate for a given of the cells. So that very high or very low point now gets diluted among other points that are more normal, I guess, in quotation marks, which makes the interpolated data be more like a normal shape distribution that is more concentrated all around the mean and it has fewer outliers, both in the low yielding, but also in the high yielding parts of that distribution. So that's why we see here that the blue one, yeah. Can you scroll up to your code, please? Yeah. Why, why not give the same? So when you ran the first part here, did that go through? I got it now. It's just my, my phone and stuff in my crowd. It's not good. Okay, nice, nice. Yeah, so this is just for us to think about it that, you know, if you have a highly dense um, layer, like maybe EOD is, maybe you could think of, is it better if I just do the cells and I just, I don't know, take the average of the points inside the cell? Maybe that could be an approach. I guess in our case, we would still have some cells that would not have any data points under them. Um, I mean, anyways, if you're doing, if you have any type of data that you're gonna have to be taking averages within the cell, or in this case, you're taking weighted averages depending on the distance from the cell to the points, you are gonna be taking averages of some sort. And every time we take averages, we are cutting down the tails of the distribution and making more norm, right? So that's what we're seeing here in this, this case as well. Okay, so we the last thing here is to export this layer to file because we're gonna be using this uh, in our exercise of, I believe, Friday. 
So let's export this uh, using the function write underscore SF. Again, because it is an SF object now that we transformed it. So the first thing we give it is the object name. So that is the IDW underscore pred underscore V. And then let's give it a path. So open and close quotation marks. I want to get outside of the code folder. So dot dot for slash. I want to go inside the data folder. And now is where we give it a name. I want to call this yield 17 underscore interpolated dot geo JSON. And after you give the path, the name and the file type here in this string, always remember to use the delete underscore DSN equals to true argument. So we don't run into issues if you run this code twice. If you run that, <clears throat> and then you navigate to the files tab, our blue button output folder, oh, sorry, not output, data folder, uh, you should have now the EO17 interpolated .geo.json right there. All right, so this wraps up the in-class exercise. I want to take a quick moment here and then open up for questions if anyone has. All right, no questions, so let's move on. Um, so our class today goes to 11.10, right? Can we go back to the show where I got lost? Yeah, that was the, which one was that? Uh, that is um, maybe here. IDW dot um, underscore pred. So, yeah. May I may I show my uh, my desktop so you can see it? So uh, let me just introduce the assignment and then I can connect with you. Is that okay, Rolando? Just so yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. other people okay. can get get rolling with the assignment. Mm -hmm. So I just folded it in the GeoJSON file, but can we export? I I I'm sure we can uh, export it in CSV so that we have. The, uh, yield values as a number for every. Uh... Yes, we we can do that as CSV. So Nivo is asking, can we? So we export as GeoJSON. Can we export it as CSV? Yes. So the difference here would really only be, you need to change the function, right? So instead of write SF, there is a function called write underscore CSV, and then you also need to change the extension here of the file. I think the yield value is just like a key value. When we before doing that, or we had value, but right now the value is. Okay, so the value. Yeah, so, so let me just make sure that, that I understand what you're saying. So if you export as GeoJSON or if you export as CSV, those values are the same. They should be the same. Yeah. The difference is whatever the IDW pred values are, they're not the same as the raw or not the raw, but the clean version, right? As we're seeing here on this distribution. Yeah, the value of the clean version before interpolation are different from the interpolated ones. Yeah. But if you, but I mean, yeah, because I, I understood what you said, but I just want to make sure that people that are hearing don't, don't get confused. So if we export as GeoJSON or as CSV, the same values. The difference is one is going to have the geospatial information, the other will not. But the EO values of CSV and GeoJSON, the same, right? <clears throat> so if you do want to export a CSV, you would just change the function here and also the extension of the file. I don't think the write, C write underscore CSV function has a delete DSN argument, so you may just need to delete that argument as well. But that's how you would export a CSV. Okay. So this assignment here originally was for you to take home, but I think we may, I think it's wise of us to try to do that in class, uh, especially because we all have different boundaries. And if you run into issues, I may be able to help you right here. So what I, the assignment 
is for basically for you to do everything, well, for you to do the interpolation exercise now on the yield 19 and yield 20 clean versions. Remember that the clean versions you created yourselves on your sites, I did not give you them. I gave you the completely raw CSV yield 19, yield 20. You wrangled and interpolated them as part of the previous assignment and you exported that yield 19, yield 20 clean.geojson. So you should have those in your computer as part of the assignments. If you did not export them to your data or output folder of this project, 07 yield monitor, make sure wherever you created them, you copy them from that place and paste them inside of this project. So what you're gonna have to do is in my case here, I have on my data folder, I have the EO17 clean, process and clean. I have my EO19 process and clean. I have my EO20 process and clean all in the data folder. So I'm asking you now to create yields, EO19 interpolated and EO20 interpolated using a similar script as this one. Um, what else? Oh, okay. So I do have an actual QMD with the assignment instructions that I'll, I'll talk about it in a second here. But I do want to show you what I, I proposed for you to do on the previous assignment. And I also propose you to do today uh, just for it, for it to be easier for you. So I know that some of you created a new project for the assignment. If you did that, that's okay. There's not going to hurt you. It's not going to change anything. What I proposed that you did was inside of the 07 new monitor, if you looked into your code, sorry, my, my phone size is not very large and it's not, I don't know how to increase it actually. If anyone knows, has a quick tip on how to do that on a Mac, I'll, I'll be all ears. So I'm sorry if you cannot see it too well on the screen. But what I'm proposing to do is on this on the code folder of the 07 uh, project, you would come here. So you would have the EO17 interpolation partial. That's the one that we just developed. What I would propose is, is you just copy that and paste twice and rename them to EO19 and then EO20 and just recycle those scripts when you do the new data sets. Again, the only difference that is when you do that, you're just gonna have to change what is the data coming in the script, right? So as you duplicate the script for the EO19 and you open that script, you will have to change the data set coming in being the EO19 uh, clean version, right? I do propose you do that and you still remain within the same project. I think it's gonna make your life a little bit easier if you do that. If we do that, we'll have to send you a rendered file. Do we have to send you two HTMLs? So, so Doug here was is asking if if you do that, do you have to send me two HTML render files? So on these assignments, I think I wasn't clear um, because some of you did what I what I intended, some of you did not. So on on these specific assignments, the only QMD I'm asking you to render is the actual assignment QMD which should not have any code, should just have the answers to my questions. So we use the class code to go through it, do the processing steps, you know, do everything we did in class, export that layer. But then on the Q, on the assignment itself, you're just giving me the answers based on your scripts where you have the code. So there's no code. We don't have to put any code into... Not on the one you send me. You're still going to have to do the code on your side. So we go through the steps, but what you send me is just going to be a, an, an HTML that you render based on a QMD that had no code. Just the answers. All right. <clears throat> so uh, I did push to GitHub this assignment. So if I launch that on my side or open that folder on my side, um, let me show you. So you're going to have to download from GitHub or do a Git pull. It's going to be in the 02 assignments folder. There's going to be assignment 06 yield interpolation. If you open that, there is this A6 questions QMD. I'm going to launch that here so we can take a look at it. Where did that? Okay, 
So here's the assignment, right? So I'm asking you now to do the same, um, the same interpolation that we did in class on the clean versions of 2019 and 2020 data sets that you created yourself. As part of the assignment, you need to interpolate both of those data sets, provide me with a statistical summary of the interpolated versions. Also export those interpolated vector versions as part of the script, just like we did in class, because we're gonna need them on the right on the next uh, exercise. I have some tips here that you can just, again, go into the 07 project on the code folder and just copy and paste the scripts just rename them to, to make it clear which one of the years you're using that script for, and then adapt that script uh, to, to do the interpolation for the EO19, EO20 clean versions. I have a deadline here of February 22nd by 11.59 PM. So tomorrow, you know, before midnight, but I think you can get most of that done today in class. And I do propose you go through that in class and use this time for that. And then I'm just asking you again, what is the mean, median, maximum for the interpolated clean EO data from 2019 and 2020? So again, you just need to either provide me a table or even if you just want to write like mean was this, median was that, and so on. You can also do that and just submit to me the render version of this 06 questions only. So you do not need to provide any code here, but you're going to have to do the coding on your side to create the the outputs that then gives you the answer to the assignment. So again, this is in the GitHub. Uh, I'm, I'm not gonna be showing you the A6 questions because you have access to that, download on your side. You're gonna have to have this version on your side to complete this. All right, so while, um, you know, some students get started on the assignment, I do want to say that if you want to take a quick break, if you need to go to the restroom or whatever it is, feel free to do that while you're working on the assignment. Please do not leave class yet because I have not taken the attendance and I will only take that at the end of this class time. Um, okay, any questions about the assignment? Right, I don't. Hi. So I would like to ask a question. Yes. So we uh, we gonna uh, do the interpolation for both nineteen and uh, both the years in the same uh, QMD, or can we do it somewhere else? Because you wanted only the answers of the question that you have asked. So what I'm proposing that you do is so I do need you to do this for both the nineteen and twenty. What I am proposing you do is copy the script that we use for the U seventeen interpolation and paste that twice in your code folder, and then rename that to be, instead of EO17 interpolation, rename it to EO19 interpolation, one of them, and the other one to EO20 interpolation, and then adapt each one of those scripts individually for each one of the years. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? All right, I don't hear anything, so I'll let you get to work on the assignment. Uh, Rolando, do you do you want to maybe let me let me put my let me put my uh, ear pods so I we don't disturb people here in Athens. Okay. Uh, and then I guess people in other campuses, if you want to mute while I help, uh, Rolando. Feel free to do that if you wish, but remember to unmute when we when we get towards the end of the the class the class time. <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to stop sharing here. If you want to go ahead and oh, let me give you permission. All right, I think you should be able to to share, Rolando. Okay. I don't see the, let me see. Chair screen, okay, here it is. All right. This is the, so this is what your code is. 
This is when we created the okay. IDW. I, I think I know where the issue is. If you go to, if you go above, like on the previous chunk. Yeah. This one? Yeah, okay. So what's going on here? So we are creating the formula for the interpolation, right? Yeah. So the data is EO17 underscore C. That's the name of the object that mm -hmm. has the data set. Yeah. However, on the formula, we need to give a column name. And if you just print EO17C, so it shows up below this chunk. So if you just run that, you're going to see that the, there is no column called EO17 underscore C. Mm -hmm. The one that we want to interpolate is the yield. So I think it's yield underscore LBAC. So the yield in pounds breaker. So that column name is what should go in the formula and not the data set name. So the data set name goes on data. So that's correct. But your formula is wrong. You don't oh. have an EO17 C column. Mm -hmm. Right. So you need to change on line 121. You need to change that EO17 C to yield underscore LBAC. Well, it has to be exactly as it is in the data frame. So if you want, you print it, yeah, go on the data, see, um, I think it's yeah, to the other side. Yeah, so it has to be exactly like that. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, so that should fix it. Now data will be uh, 122 is good, right? Yeah, yeah, data is correct. Right. Yeah, you got it. All right. Yeah, so now everything else should, should run smoothly if you were able to copy the code. <clears throat> Stars, yeah. Okay, this one should be here. I think I missed some of the code here. Yeah, let me... Um, I'm going to start sharing. Stop sharing. Yeah, let me share mine so, so you can see my script. Oops, that's not it. That's not it either. Is it? Okay, so I think you... I think the, the chunk you were right now is this one. So what I'm, what I'm gonna but, do, Rolando, so I think now it's just a matter of you copying the code. Um, yeah. So I'm gonna remove my ear, ear pods so we can talk and yeah. everyone can hear it. Uh, so whenever yes. you're ready, whenever you, you're ready for me to move to, to the next chunk so you can make sure that you have the right code, just let me know and I'll, I'll scroll down. Yes, sir, thank you. All right. Can you move the ch down, Professor, please? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat>
Can you move it down? Professor, may I see the next chunk? Thank you. Yeah, so just the answers and then render and send me the HTML.
Uh, Dr. Bastos? Yes. <clears throat> uh, so I have done all the things that you have asked for. And now I, when it comes to rendering, can you help me? I mean, uh, I have the codes. Do I have to deactivate all of them and then render it or what? No. So all I'm asking for you to do is to answer the questions on the assignment um, QMD. So the one, okay. let, me, let me pull that up here. Say that again. Yeah, you just uh, you just want to so on the A six questions, you just want to follow the instructions there, which include like rendering and then including your name both here and also on the render file, and then you just want to answer your questions. So the only thing I want you to send me is the render version of this A six questions by giving your name. Here on the file also on the file name after you render it and i just want that html so before you know it seems like a lot of you are getting done so before you all wrap up uh and and leave let me take attendance and before that i just have another another assignment for you to do which is not going to be in class and it's actually due on sunday it is a reading assignment uh, which is assignment number seven. It's already, once you once you downloaded assignment six, assignment seven was already part of the repo, so it's there. For assignment seven, I'm giving you a paper to read, 
uh, that's going to be talking about yield stability analysis and classification. The reason why I want you to read that is because we're going to implement the the methodology of this paper in our next exercise. And I want you to have more background of why we're doing this and how we're doing it. So what the assignment is just asking you to read this paper and then answer here a few questions or a handful of questions, but they, they're pretty straightforward. And to actually send to me by by the end of Monday. So you have more a little bit more time so monday february 26 by 11 59 p.m i want you to send me the render version of this assignment seven following the instructions here to include your name as well so just a reading assignment to give you more background of what we're going to be doing on the next um, exercise all right so introduce assignment seven now let me get your attendance <clears throat> yes. Uh, just, just kind of want to double check for the assignment six, where you want us to pull the those stats from. That's from the the cleaned assignments that we did. The assignment five, correct? So for assignment six, which is the one that you're all doing now. I want you to provide me the summary statistics of the interpolated layer. Okay, so that's what it's um, like estimating. Yeah, so that's the one. So when in class, when we, let me pull up here. So when we're comparing this, these two lines here, so the blue line was the was the data points that we cleaned, right? So before interpolating, the blue is before interpolating, the black is after interpolating. So what I'm asking you is to provide me the statistical summary of the interpolated layer. So it would be the black one in this plot, which is coming from that IDW Prad B. All right, thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you all. I'll be here for the until eleven ten. If anyone has questions, but if you already finish your project, you, you know, claim your attendance and you're free to go. I have finished for twenty, mm -hmm. and here's my answer. That nineteen is working. I don't know what's going on. Do we maybe want to? Maybe you want to have a seat at your at your tables because then I can help yeah. you better than oh, over here. So this is saying the data is not there, but that's what and this is for the for the meeting. The scripts, did you move the scripts here for me? So, my point is, let's see what the one is for me. So what I would like to do is maybe so let's just go ahead and save all of your scripts so we don't lose anything. And I would say that this 
Would you start hard? Oh, no, 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 Well, that's the profile. Maybe that's for the I'm just going to go over the rules and you can just say what you want to say. Okay. I'm not sure, I'm not sure why. <laughs> So if you um, can you send this to me by email to a tier basin? Because I wanna I wanna see if I can import in my in my art studio. And that's really odd. I don't know what's what the big problem is. So uh, yeah, make us do some more investigation. All right, um, I'm going to disconnect here. Um, make sure you finish this exercise before Friday, because we're going to be needing the layers that you create from this exercise. And um, yeah, and, and then, of course, make sure you send me the, the assignment by Thursday if you have not been able to, to finish in class. I mean, assignment six, right? Assignment seven is by next Monday. All right. Thanks, everyone. And I'll see you on Friday.